This program is brought to you by Emory University. And at this time, I'd like for us to get started. We're still waiting on a panelist, but I think we should just go ahead and, and go for it. So I'd like to welcome Emily Nicholas. She's going to be our moderator tonight. Um, she's our treasurer. And welcome. Let's get started. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me OK in the back? OK. Um, like Elizabeth said, my name is Emily Nicklaus, and it is my pleasure to be here today to moderate this panel. I would like to thank you all for being here, and I would especially like to thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules and evenings to be here with us at Emory for this important conversation about immigration reform. <clears throat> Um, the way this evening is going to go is I will introduce our panelists and then Professor Price will give an overview of the current reform just so everybody knows what's going on. It's been all over the news. Um, a lot has been happening, so it would be great to get the updates from her. From there, I will ask some questions to our panelists and then I'll open it up to questions from the audience. So to my immediate right is Mr. Charles Cook. Uh, Mr. Cook is the managing attorney at Cook Immigration Partners here in Atlanta. He served as the national president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association from 2008 to 2009. And it is my great pleasure to announce that he has accepted a position as an adjunct professor here at Emory Law. And he'll be teaching an upper level, upper level business immigration course this spring. So everyone who's registering on Opus at 9 o'clock, take that class. Um, <laughs> to his right is Mr. Daryl Buffenstein, and thank you so much, Mr. Buffenstein, for coming. I know it was late notice. We were supposed to have Kevin Miner, who had a family uh, issue, so thank you very much for being here. He is a partner at Fragman Del Rey uh, Burnson and Lowy's Atlanta office. His experience includes testifying before Congress on various corporate immigration issues and writing key business provisions in major pieces of immigration legislation over the last 16 years. As a former president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, Mr. Buffenstein was responsible for leading a successful campaign to defend legal immigration in response to efforts in Congress to radically restrict immigration. He also served a four-year term as the general counsel to the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Next, we have Ms. Amna Shirazi. She is a managing partner at Shirazi Law Group. She earned her JD from Georgia State University and her LLM here from Emory. She currently serves on the Advocacy Committee of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and she has a very successful immigration practice focusing on deportation defense, detention, asylum, family immigration, domestic violence, and consular issues. Last but not least is our very own Professor Polly Price. She is a tenured professor of law here at Emory, where among other classes, she teaches citizenship and immigration law. She graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School and went on to clerk for the Honorable Richard Arnold on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. This year, Professor Price was named a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Fellow to study tuberculosis control along the US-Mexico border. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. And I would also like to welcome you to Emory, and I appreciate all of you coming here, and especially our panelists for sharing their time with us. My job is to give you a very brief overview of where we are in immigration reform. And for those of you who know a lot about this, you'll realize how, uh, how much of a brief overview it really is. But it's to set the stage for what we will be hearing from our panelists who certainly know a great deal about the, these issues that are at stake. What I'd like to do is just begin with uh, what I've termed here basics of the 2013 Senate immigration bill, the one that's been referred to as the Comprehensive Immigration Bill from the Senate. And it has a few features here that we should uh, think about briefly. The bill addresses most aspects of the immigration process from border and enforcement issues to legal immigration reform. It makes changes to the family and employment-based visa categories for immigrants, provides some increased due process protections, and increases the availability of non-immigrant workers to supplement 
uh, sectors of the workforce. And most importantly for many persons who are concerned with this process, it provides uh, legal status potentially to 11 million undocumented immig immigrants within the United States. The group of eight senators who put this together released a statement indicating that it's time to address these issues, uh, quote, by finally committing the resources needed to secure the border, modernize and streamline our current legal immigration system while creating a tough but fair legalization program for individuals who are currently here. I want to show you just, uh, again, summaries of the titles. It's a very complex bill, and I hope that uh, our um, panelists will go into uh, detail as necessary for their specific areas. But just in terms of the, um, let me see if I get my, here we have, just looking at Title I. So this is uh, lengthy, but it in, um, includes border security requirements for various border plans, triggers in the structure for uh, Department of Homeland Security oversight. Title II of the Senate Immigration Bill deals with the legalization of the current undocumented population, the regulation of future immigrant flows, and the integration of newcomers. So among the topics in Title II, how to deal with backlogs in the immigration system and increased visas, some of that will come through, among other ways, eliminating the diversity visa lottery the fourth preference category for family preference, uh, not counting employee family members against um, the uh, ceiling and, and so forth. So various specific provisions that are there, but that's generally what Title II addresses. Title III, in interior enforcement addresses, among other things, E-Verify, humanitarian reforms, and some due process changes. And Title IV addresses existing visa programs for non-immigrant workers and creates a new W visa for lesser skilled workers along with a government office to monitor the current employment numbers in the United States and to adjust those visa caps accordingly. So in terms of um, detail, I want to show you, a, this is part of a chart of the proposed paths to legalization, paths to citizenship for undocumented aliens. Um, I couldn't fit the whole thing on here, so all we have is the top, but I wanted to point out a few things for you, and this is from the Senate bill. Uh, if you see sort of paths to citizenship, there's a special agricultural worker path, and it says the fastest track to citizenship on this path is 10 years. Um, there's a dreamer path, and that is childhood arrivals. It's similar to the DREAM Act, and in fact would cover most of those uh, for whom the DREAM Act would have benefited, and they have a faster track. And then in the middle, uh, it just, it gets very complicated, and it <laughs> could be, I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. Um, but it, this is, one reason to focus on this is uh, we have yet to see anything on the House side that addresses legalization. So what I'd like to do really is spend less time on the Senate bill, since we've had that around since June, and uh, lots of opportunity to think about it, and bring you up to date on what is happening in the House of Representatives. Um, this is a recent headline. Some had predicted that with the uh, budget crisis and government shutdown that immigration was dead for the year, but the Washington Post had a headline that said, uh, immigration reform is definitely undead. Um, and, in, and in particular, there are five immigration bills that have uh, been referred out of committee within the House. So no votes yet, but uh, this is, these are significant steps forward. And what you'll notice about this is uh, this is a piecemeal approach. None of these uh, purport to be comprehensive immigration reform in the way that the Senate bill is portrayed, and I'd like to go over briefly with you what these five separate bills are. The most important is uh, the border security legislation, or it's, uh, it, it's at least deemed to have the most bipartisan support in terms of uh, its chance for gaining uh, broad bipartisan support. And here's a, a quotation about that. 
The Border Security Results Act, which is the name of the, of the bill in the House, addresses border security. It does not address immigration reform. The reason is simple. According to uh, Representative Michael McCall, we cannot repeat 1986 where legalization happened but the border security enforcement measures were never fulfilled. Uh, so this tells you just from, from these two notes here. He doesn't mention why they weren't fulfilled, does he? No. <laughs> no, th but you can see the fault lines, yeah. you know, where the fault lines lie. But, but in any event, the Border Security Act, um, it, it calls on the Department of Homeland Security to create a plan to make sure that within five years, at least 90% of all illegal border crossings across along the southwestern U.S. border are apprehended. Um, the bill also lays out several um, ways to measure how well security is improving along the border, such as um, the amount of illicit drugs seized by Border Patrol agents. Okay, so that's one bill. Um, and then moving on, agriculture workers. They have a, a bill that has been reported out with respect to uh, this group. This legislation would allow foreign agricultural workers to temporarily come to the United States. Um, it would allow immigrants to stay in the country for a period of 18 to 36 months, depending upon the position. Uh, the cap is set at 500,000 visas, although that can be adjusted according to market needs. Now, the uh, critical point here is no path to a green card. And it also sets clear incentives for farm workers to leave the United States at the end of this period. For example, employers are required to withhold 10 percent of workers' wages um, in a government trust fund, which they can retrieve only when they return to their home country. And again, while the House bill allows current undocumented immigrants to join this new agricultural guest worker program, it lays out no pathway to a green card and ultimately citizenship like the Senate legislation does. All right, um, the, uh, a lot of action in this area, high-skilled workers, and I just I brought in a recent New York Times headline, Business Conservative Alliance Presses for Immigration Action. So if you uh, sort of follow the money on uh, what are the priorities for immigration reform in the House, this is one place to look. High-skilled workers, the proposal for the House of Representatives increases the number of visas for high-skilled immigrants. And uh, as, as I say here, this bill is backed by uh, a number of industry groups. SLU might not be the most appropriate word, but that's uh, a number of industry groups. Um, and here the House and Senate seem to be very much in accord. The, the House bill for high-skilled workers is similar to the Senate bill. Both bills would lift the current 65,000 cap on H-1B visas, which this year was reached in one week. Um, the House would raise it to 155,000 with an additional 40,000 for immigrants who graduate from a U.S. university. Uh, in the Senate, the cap is set at 110,000 and can go up to 180,000 with um, 25,000 more visas set aside for foreigners who earn, um, earn advanced degrees here in the United States in science, technology, engineering, or math. Now, there are two other bills that I will say less about um, that have been reported through committees. There's the SAFE Act bill. It increases Ooh. the authority. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not uh, endorsing the names. Um, it happens to be known as the SAFE Act bill. It increases authority of state and local law enforcement in punishing illegal migrants. These are the descriptions taken from the, the, uh, the bills themselves, among other things that this does. And then uh, there's a bill uh, specifically with respect to employment enforcement, E-Verify mandates employers to check on the legal status of employees or face harsh fines. So I think I will stop there. That's, again, uh, an inadequate overview, but hopefully enough to get us uh, started on this discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to first just turn to Mr. Cook, who was booing during the <laughs> SAFE Act portion. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about why the SAFE Act is not a good act? And Imagine the worst <laughs> bill you could write if you hated all immigrants. This is worse than that. It's a terrible bill. It, it completely eviscerates civil rights in the United States, completely destroys any humanitarian touch we have to our programs. 
Uh, and, at, and at the end of the day, it will never see the light of day as a bill. Uh, it was written by the anti-immigration group, Center for Immig Immigration Studies, the Federation uh, Against Immigration Reform, or whatever they call themselves for fair these days, uh, and uh, the other related anti-immigration groups. It's a terrible, terrible bill put forward by the worst of the anti-immigration congressmen. It passed on a, uh, a voice vote by majority of just Republicans, no Democratic votes, and it will never see the light of day. It's, it really is a horrible bill. It makes... I refer to IRA, IRA. IRA, IRA was a bill, the Illegal Immigration Reform Act, Immigrant Responsibility Act 1996, uh, was a bad bill. This is 50 times worse than that bill. It, it will eviscerate civil rights in the immigration context. That's why it's bad. So you give it Ooh. about a 3% chance of, of uh, going to a vote? I, I don't, that bill will not see a vote on the House floor. Not at all. How do you feel about it? I really don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as a follow-up to that, I heard you speak at another panel recently, and you were adamant that we would see immigration reform this year. Do your, are your feelings the same towards that? Can you explain where we are in terms of progress? Are we going to see a vote? And if so, are the major provisions going to be passed in terms of a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million? I'd love to hear Daryl's view on this. I remain convinced that we will have immigration reform vote this year. I do. I remain convinced. Even when they said it was, before they said it was undead, they said it was dead, which is why they had to come out and say it was dead. Um, uh, I believe that the government shutdown helps the immigration reform bill. Um, I'm disappointed, by the way, that, that the Emory Republican caucus is not here, because at least two-thirds two -thirds of this panel are Republicans. I don't know if everybody else is, but two of us are. Uh, this is an important issue to the GOP if they have any hope of ever winning an election in the future for President of the United States period. Uh, they need to win, and the only bill they have to win on is immigration that's pending in Congress right now. Uh, people complain or note there's very few days that Congress is in session between now and the end of the year. I think there's now 12 or 13 days or something like that. You don't need a lot of time in the House to have a bill. It's not the Senate. Uh, you can literally, as evidenced by the fact that we voted 44 times to eliminate Obamacare, uh, you don't need a lot of time to put a bill on the floor of, this, of, of the House. Um, and nor do you need a lot of time to get it through a committee. Uh, most of these bills are done that would form the basis of a piecemeal approach towards a comprehensive solution. They're mostly done. Um, and uh, they're just waiting to be voted on at this point. So I, I remain convinced. I'd love to hear Daryl's point of view, though. Uh, well, if I may, I, I think, uh, you know, the problem with the, these uh, political prognostications, uh, particularly on the bill, is they're 100% accurate 50% of the time. <laughs> and um, the, I think there's, uh, Chuck saw, makes a very compelling argument. I think uh, that's definitely a scenario that could play out. I just want to throw in the other side. Um, when when uh, the general election was over, Everyone woke up the next morning and said, wow, immigration reform is where it's at, and the uh, Latino vote uh, is going to dictate moving on immigration, making things really ch shake the system up and give a good chance for comprehensive immigration reform. But what it didn't take into account and what's become more evident in the House races around the country there are very many seats where there is Tea Party uh, um, opposition uh, in the primaries, and the folks that are in the, the incumbents in those seats are going back and saying, well, hang on, what's the calculus here? Maybe from, from the presidential election standpoint, immigration reform is a good idea, but I can't worry about that. I'm worried about my seat, and what's the benefit to me uh, saying that immigration is a good thing? If you look at seats in districts where immigration really is critically pivotal and could make a substantial difference, and I'm throwing out numbers, Chuck, uh, maybe I'm wrong about it, there's about 10 or 15 seats, house 20. seats, 20, 20, 20, where, it would 20 make, seats. where it would make a big difference. How many seats would, it, is there substantial right-wing Tea Party opposition? You know, probably 60 most, or 70. Probably 16 or more, there's a chance for opposition, absolutely. Six, 60 or 70. So, so the, the, the arithmetic isn't tremendous in that, in, in, in that uh, connection. And uh, the, 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 the government shutdown plays both ways. It plays the way Chuck said, and then it also plays a different way, which is the Republicans in the House saying, listen, uh, what do we stand? I immigration reform is either going to give Obama another victory, an opportunity for him, this is in their view, not mine, to be intransigent and not compromise and so on and win 
uh, or alternatively, it's going to give us an, another uh, problem if we, if we vote for it. So either way, we lose. Um, that's just sort of a different perspective. Now, Chuck is close to a lot of Republicans in the House, knows what's... What, what the well, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, tonight, there's actually a race tonight uh, that's very, very important on this issue. And oddly enough, it's in South Alabama. Uh, it's a Republican. It's basically it's a it's a congressional race to fill an empty seat, but it's only two candidates are Republicans. One who is sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce, who's been pro-immigration, pro-immigration reform. The other sponsor, another is a Tea Party guy. And depending on how that race goes, could play a lot into the strength of Tea Party candidates going forward. If if the if the mainstream GOP guy wins, I think we have an increased chance for immigration reform. Oddly enough, if you had a, if you took the the bill that was introduced by the Democrats which is a Senate bill, it's called H.R. 15, and had a vote today on the House floor, it would pass. It would pass. There's enough votes to pass the bill. It goes back to the, the Hastert, I call it the Hastert rule, but it's not really a rule, it's a Hastert recommendation, I think, uh, that uh, the, the Boehner will not bring up a vote on any bill unless a majority of the majority of Republicans support the bill. He has violated that rule five times in the last year and a half, most recently two weeks ago when we reopened the government. Uh, and uh, so I do believe we're going to have this vote. Three Republicans have come out in the last week to support the House bill introduced by Democrats in, in completion. There are an additional 20 seats in which that are controlled by Republicans, but which there are 40 percent Latino vote in that district. Uh, when, when you say a vote, do you mean they'll bring up one of the bills that Professor Price mentioned and pass it and then use that as an opportunity? No, I'm talking about House Bill talking H.R. 15 on the comprehensive, on the comprehensive bill. bill. Now, if they decide to do the piecemeal approach, which would be fine, even Congressman Gutierrez came out and said, you know, whatever. What they will find, I think, is a, a large willingness to negotiate. This is not health care. This is not turning over the only legacy item I have I'm not going to negotiate. Barack Obama has been a terrible president on immigration, atrocious on immigration, the, the most enforcement-minded, family-destroying president we've had in our lifetimes. Most That's the most deportations ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, ever. It's been remarkable in five years. Um, well, DACA was, it was, it was a, a payoff to keep his campaign offices open. Uh, Dreamers were shutting down his campaign offices last spring before the election. He had to do something. Um, I mean, if you think it's anything other than a political ploy, I mean, that's clearly what it is. Uh, but he will negotiate. And I wouldn't be surprised if there is a bill that comes up that passes the House that says no path to citizenship, but will give you legal status for six or eight years. Frankly, I would take that because that's just the law now. In six years, you go, what do we do with all these people that have to go home? They've, now they've been here legally. Now they've been paying taxes. Trust me, we'll fix that problem in the future. I mean, I would take whatever we get. The other big thing to remember, though, in all this is everybody goes back to the amnesty of 86. Now, you were practicing back then. I was in law school when amnesty passed. Amnesty was a back, the 86 bill in IRCA was a backward-looking bill. It was fixing a problem. It was not forward-looking. I think this comprehensive bill that's passed the Senate and which been issued in the House is actually a forward-looking bill. And that was the mistake of, of IRCA. It wasn't forward-looking. It didn't say, did they actually think people who got green cards through amnesty were going to keep picking vegetables? No. They went and got better jobs. And who was left to pick vegetables? Nobody. Because there was no visas to bring them into the country. Uh, nobody to do that work. And we d basically didn't enforce employer sanctions. Uh, this bill that's out there, the most important part of it is not the legalization part, because we can deal with that over time. It's the forward-looking approach to family-based immigration and employment-based immigration that makes us more competitive as a country going forward. Although there's a question about whether it's enough on the... Uh, I agree. It's, it's, but again, this is one of those things where you can, let's take what we can get now, because we are in a situation where there has to be compromise. Nothing perfect is going to pass this Congress. It can't. By definition, look at the congressman. You know, they're going to have to bring something that they all agree on. If that's the base common denominator, mandatory e-verify for employers, a temporary path for status for people, increased visa numbers, the Skills Act, for example. Take it and run and come back in two years after the election, come back after 2016 at the next election and see where we are. Uh, I will take any step now forward, any step. Thank you. And that's how I feel. <laughs>
That's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> I'd like to get into a little bit of the family-based immigration provisions that we've seen. Uh, Ms. Benzman, uh, under current law, U.S. citizens can sponsor spouses, children, and siblings to come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. with limits on some of those categories. Um, but the Senate bill would bar citizens from sponsoring their siblings and would allow them to sponsor married sons and daughters only if those children are under the age of 31. Uh, in your practice, do you see this as a positive or negative for uh, family-based immigration? I think in this bill, if you're gonna pick a fight on anything, that is not something I would pick a fight with. Um, Brother-sister petitions, and I don't know if everyone else has done them, I mean, I could file them today and they're not gonna be ready till 20, 85. Mm -hmm. So in, re in reality, it's really not doing anything for them. Mm -hmm. So if you can get rid of that and include the, um, the married children up to an age, I, th I have no problems with that. I think that's a good move forward mm -hmm. because the brother-sister petitions is just ridiculous. The amount of wait time that you have for that. Um, people will lose their, their um, applications before then. You, can't, you have to recall those. Um, and then by that time, the brother and sister are married and have kids and, and everything else. And then you got to include all them. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes very problematic. I think, you know, it's, it's unrealistic to say you can file for your brother or sister and then they have to wait, you know, 23 years to use that petition. So if you're going to fight on something, that's not something that I have a problem with. And they wouldn't take away people in the line. Right. People they, in the line still get They still can wait their 23 years. They still can wait years. 20 years. Yeah. It's just the new petitions the, you will right. to file. Yeah. Right. I don't think that's any um, issue that I would um, have a problem with. What would be, what's the best provision in terms of that would affect your practice? What would do the most for, for I your clients? I think what you would, you know, people would consider the overall amnesty if you've been here a certain time mm -hmm. that you get a path to residency. That would affect our practice tremendously because right now, um, you know, who's available for relief is really type of um, humanitarian type cases. Um, U visas, which are victims of crimes, VAWA, you know, everybody else with family type petitions, even if you're married to a U.S. citizen, most of our clients enter the United States illegally and they're barred from getting their adjustment here and they have to get a waiver for their um, bars for entering illegally. So it separates families for a long period of time. So really our practice would end up being that type of application. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think it'll be great, um, but we'll be very busy. <laughs> that's a good thing. Really <laughs> no, I course. don't. That's why I ended <laughs> up, I, that's why I was so prompt yes. in getting here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, Ms. Shirazi, we have seen the number of detained immigrants increase to more than 400,000 per year in the Obama administration. How will the provisions proposed in either the House or Senate deal with detained immigration and uh, will the congressionally mandated detention of 34,000 immigrants per day remain? Um, how it would deal with it would be, I guess, what we could see is some sort of relief being given to some of our detained clients. Um, many of our clients who are detained aren't able to get out of detention because they have no form of relief available to them. Uh, DACA, for example, has not been something that um, judges have been bonding uh, people out of jail for. Um, we've seen that the judges will say, well, you know, that's well and good that they have DACA available to them, but that's not something that I have jurisdiction over. So unless it gets approved while they're in my, you know, uh, jurisdiction, I have no control over it. They'll go ahead and, and remove the person. So um, that's if we could find some some way to give people relief, whether it's through some um, sort of family based um, provision that would be, for example, like 245I back in 2001, where immediate family members were able to somehow pay some sort of a penalty and stay in the United States as opposed to filing a 601A waiver, which is you know may, right now making a lot of my clients have to take deportations or voluntary departure orders in order to leave, in order to come back. It, um, so I think that if we had these types of immediate forms of relief available to people, it would really as assist a lot of the people who are detained. Um, so. There actually are some remarkably great provisions in the Senate bill and in the H.R. 15 on immigration people in deportation proceedings. I mean, remarkable stuff. A complete restoration of due process in the immigration context. If, if you ever want to see a place where the Constitution of the U.S. does not work, go to immigration court, where there are no rules of evidence there's no discovery, there's no public defender, 80% of the folks have nobody representing them, and justice is dispensed swiftly as a star chamber. 
go down there and have your eyes open. This bill actually restores much of that. Uh, folks right now, for example, if they are long-term permanent residents but they commit a crime and they're arrested and, and then taken to immigration custody, are ineligible for a bond. A bond. They can't even get a bond to get out and be with their family. Uh, if uh, folks have been in the U.S. for a long time, 10, 15, 20 years, and they have kids here, the standard to get re relief is to show that your children or your spouse would suffer extraordinary or highly unusual hardship, which means basically your child has two heads. That, that would be extraordinary. That's kind of the standard. 10% of those cases are granted. This bill restores standards of hardship that are rational to an actor, rational under the Constitution. And, you know, that's what we need. Now, I will tell you, Omni, you said something very interesting, 245I. I want to ask you, Daryl, what are the chances that 245I is coming back? Zero. Zero. Uh, 245I, you know, we talk, I'm sorry, we're jargon speakers. <laughs> so I really apologize in advance. Uh, 245I is a section 245I of the Immigration Nationality Act, which said that if you entered the U.S., the last time it was in law, if you entered the U.S. before December 20th, 2000, and somebody filed for you for an immigrant petition before April 30th, 2001, then when your turn in line comes up, you can pay a fine. That is the very definition of an amnesty, by the way. Um, that will never come back. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to happen because it's an amnesty. Uh, but that was a good thing. It helped people. The sad part about that is people didn't realize how good it was. Um, evidenced by the fact that everybody applied on April 29th and April 30th, but so many millions of others did not. Well, and, and our clients are still seeing the benefits of it. I mean, yeah, how many exactly. times have we gone to court yeah. and been able to grandfather in a petition yeah. based on these old um, I-130s that have been thing. hanging around? So uh, as far as, as uh, to, to answer your question, um, when I see a client who's detained, especially in a place like Stewart County where, you know, I'm, I'm frequently appearing, um, I often wonder whether or not they're going to have any help from this bill at all because mm -hmm. I think that um, just the way things are structured, especially at Stewart County, um, prevents so many people from getting out, even if there is a relief available to them. And this oftentimes, and this is another issue that we've discussed in other panels here at Emory, um, it, it comes down to who are the judges that are sitting, um, you know, on these benches. It's such an arbitrary uh, rule of law in the immigration courts to go back to Chuck Cook's point about um, the lack of, 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 of constitutionality in these courts. So um, I think that when, you know, I'm looking at this Senate bill, I'm not looking so much at my detained clients as I am my non-detained clients and those people who do have some sort of form of relief. I think that we sort of look at this as um, different levels of, of, of priority. Um, in this situation where she spoke about, um, I'm not going to pick this fight. We know that we're going to have casualties with with this Senate bill or the House bill or whatever bill that's passed. I agree with Chuck in that um, I'll take whatever we're given at this point because right now things have been sort of at a standstill for many of my clients. Um, I have clients who are begging to be put in removal proceedings so that they can defensively apply for some sort of um, work permit or, or something that's going to give them some sort of status to be able to get a driver's license. So many people are just sort of in um, no man's land. And so I, I would take anything that's given to us. So if it doesn't help my detained clients, and I wish it would, um, um, that, that to me is they're already, honestly, especially if they're in a place like Stewart County, halfway outside the country as far as I'm concerned, I want to help the many of my clients that are here, mm -hmm. that, have cl that have kids that, who, who are, you know, working, paying their taxes, you know, not committing crimes, and, and just trying to become legal. Uh, in any way that they can, so. By, by the way, I just want to make a point, and I'm, I'm sure you uh, appreciate this uh, very keenly, and that is that uh, if the bill goes forward, if something passes in the House, whether it's uh, H.R. 15 or something else gets conferenced and there's, a, there's an immigration bill, it's not, in my view, and I'm sorry to be pessimistic, it's not going to be better in all these respects than it is now. It could be a lot, oh, no, and lot probably worse, will yeah. be a lot worse, because in the negotiations between the Senate and the House, this is a few people around a table at midnight. Um, they're going to they're going to do stuff that we really don't want to see. That's where the sausage gets made. Is it? <laughs> right there. Conference committee. The what? 
The sausage. sausage. That's where the sausage, sausage gets. Made. Never watch Laws or Sausages getting made, isn't it? Have you heard about this? Not sausages. I've never seen it. <laughs> I have to say, I have um, one other thing that was in the bill that really was um, really a um, proactive part, and I believe it was in the Senate. I'm not sure if it made it to the House bill. I'm pretty sure it did, though. Is did you, they um, are considering funding um, defense representation for mentally incompetent and juveniles, which is huge. Um, it's a really big deal. It opens the door to finally recognize that there needs to be some type of public defender. Of course, we want it to be Catholic Charities. Um, that's my plug. But um, we are exploring that option, and that is really, really um, proactive. Because as of right now, at the Stewart Detention Center, I do appear for mental incompetency hearings if the judge asks me to, um, because nobody else is available. Um, and I really do think that those two vulnerable populations need to have appointed that's representation. And I think it's a, a really good move forward. Do you know where the funding for that would come from? It's something we've talked about in our immigration class, the kind of civil Gideon, because mm -hmm. these are not criminal proceedings, there are no right. appointed counsel. So how is this something that you could see moving forward into representation for all immigrants, or is it just too big to fund? It depends on the government. I mean, right now, you know, we do get funding, Catholic Charities gets funding from EYR that goes through the Vera Institute of Justice to provide a group orientation, know your rights to all new detainees at Stewart Detention Center. We've been doing that for four years. So it's a roundabout way. If they, if they can get the money, they can funnel it around. We mm -hmm. don't get it directly from, from the government, but it, go, it goes, it's passed through. So yeah, there is the money and, and they could figure out a way to do it. Yeah, that would be very helpful, <laughs> I'm sure. Well, they found enough money to spend $36 billion to buy Sikorsky helicopters to patrol the border. They could probably find $5 million to fund engine and defense in the United States. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I it's don't, a meaningless I, amount of money think, in the grand scheme of things. I don't think finding thing. the money is really the issue. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Speaking of the border security uh, issues, Professor Price, on the issue of enforcement, do we have an illegal immigration crisis on our hands today and also based on your experience working at the El Paso border last summer do you think that we need to strengthen our borders or do you think additional border security would have adverse consequences? Well I think the emphasis on increasing security at the border is is overkill and overblown yeah, yeah, and yeah, over expensive and the money could be spent in so many better ways. And it's, uh, you know, as most people here are probably aware, the undocumented population of 11 million is, you know, at least half of that are visa overstays and not persons who are surreptitiously crossing the border. So from my experience in El Paso, it looks like we're pretty secure. I saw along the uh, Rio Grande something that looked like a sort of a new age uh, Goodyear blimp of a small size over at Air Force Base, but it was right along the border. It was the eye in the sky and, and border patrol agents everywhere. It's, I mean, it's hard to imagine beefing that up. Um, but so I thought that there was plenty of um, plenty of security and spending money in that way. I mean, it, you know, it could help marginally. Uh, but I, one of the reasons that I was in El Paso was working at the um, Federal Centers for Disease Control quarantine station on the issue of cross-border tuberculosis control. So it raises all sorts of public health issues where authorities on both sides of the border don't care about citizenship or nationality. They care about the public health concern and how to contain it. And so some of these enhanced security measures have really you know, caused some problems with um, you know, the frequent border crossers that are you know, completely legal and with commerce and so forth and just trying to control that. So, so from my perspective, uh, I think it's just, it, it's, it's too much emphasis on the securing the borders, but I see politically why that is prominent. You know, it's funny, I had a conversation last week with a Republican congressman um, uh, who acknowledged that, in his opinion, the border was secure. We could build fences, but he says it's meaning, fences are meaningless. Uh, he was concerned about having knowledge of how many people are coming in. To him, it was an issue of surveillance. Uh, when this bill talks about having 90% of the border secure, well, you can't just make up a number. You've got to know. Uh, so rather than buying, and literally, if you read the Senate bill, you will see that they literally pick up eight Sikorsky helicopters in the El Paso sector, three in the, uh, in the, in the Hidalgo sector. I mean, just crazy stuff like that. But the, the key issue to him was surveillance getting that eye in the sky, knowing who's coming in. Because once you know who's coming in, you can do a much easier and better job of stopping them in the future. Yeah, you know, I, I'd like to add, I think that um, Cong we have an illegal immigration problem 
And the reason we have it is because Congress and U.S. policymakers and successive administrations have created it. That's, that's the reason we have it. So if, if, and the extent to which they do that is not generally known. So just to pick an example, if you create all kinds of consequences, if, if, you make, if you have a system that makes it extremely difficult to extend someone's status when they're here on a legitimate visa, and they get tied up in bureaucracy, and the visa doesn't get approved in time, and they have a period of time that they're not lawful, then we say, well, they're illegal. Well, the this, this, this system has created that illegality. Um, and we, we, we change the laws so that people who've committed very minor infractions are now treated like dangerous criminals. And then we say, well, we've got a problem. We've got all these dangerous criminals. We need to deport them. What well, we defined dangerous criminals as people who had previously what was referred to as a misdemeanor and, and maybe didn't even have intent for the crime. And that people will come back through the border and, and uh, run into a problem at customs and, and, uh, and uh, border patrol that, um, that previously they would never have run into because 15 years ago they had some minor infraction. So we're creating the problem and we're painting an economic phenomena with a, with a, with a legal brush. And we're saying, well, you know, people, the, the, the push-pull, uh, people that come from foreign countries, come from Mexico, that's an economic phenomenon, and it's going to go on as long as the economy draws people uh, in. And, and that's why what Chuck said is so important about having a guest worker program. Um, staying with you, Mr. Buffenstein, I would like to talk with you about uh, H-1B visas. And we've seen a lot of CEOs, big CEOs like Mark Zuckerberg, everybody knows him, um, speak out in favor of immigrants. That's Facebook account. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, he has spoken out in favor of immigration reform and specifically in favor of increasing the number of H-1B visas available annually. Can you talk about how that would affect your immigration practice in the business world and whether you think that's a good idea. Right, and, and to step back a second on that, um, the immigration is, affects very dramatically the ability of US companies to compete on international markets. We don't think about, well the average person doesn't think about immigration as a competition issue, but it is. If you have a company that uh, is competing with Japanese and German and Canadian companies for international markets, and you're marketing in Saudi Arabia and you need an expert that understands the conditions there or you're selling vehicles and trucks into Brazil and you, you need someone that really understands what the impact of the uh, roads in the jungle have on these particular trucks and, and what the consumer preferences are in Brazil and you've got the opportunity to hire an individual who's a marketing expert on for Brazil and that's going to increase your sales it's going to allow you to employ more people here you want to bring that person in and employ them most frequently if they're not someone that's an intracompany transferee or not permitted a visa pursuant to some treaty they're going to need a work permit to work here and that work permit is the H1B visa over the years successively it's been tightened up uh, and, and more and more, there's been more and more enforcement in connection with it, more and more hoops to jump through. Uh, a quota was added uh, in uh, 1990. Before that, there was no quota. And, and then a, a certain promise to the Labor Department about wages and working conditions was added. It was four or five lines that ended up being 65 pages of fine print government regulation. But more and more conditions were added to, to the visa. We today have the base quota for these visas is 65,000, and then there's uh, 20,000 20, additional for U.S. master's degree uh, holders. But that base cap is unchanged since 1990. So if you look at you know, 23 years, how the U.S. economy has changed. Back in 1990, 15% of U.S. households had a personal computer, and today we walk around with personal computers in our in our pockets. So the the economy's changed. The information technology revolution has been uh, evident, and we have the same number of H-1B visas. That's why people like Zuckerberg are getting on the bandwagon and saying that this is very bad for the very bad for the economy. Um, 
the, the Senate bill would increase the H-1B cap, the base cap, to 110,000, and I think uh, Professor Price mentioned that, and then, and then uh, there's a uh, market escalator that could potentially increase it to 180 to 180,000. But um, this is a big argument in Congress, and this is where there's a lot of disagreement, because the opponents of business immigration say that uh, they, they have a lot of zero-sum thinking. Look, if you bring another person into the United States, exactly, you bring one more person into the United States, that's one less job for an American, right? Well, wrong, because H-1Bs create, uh, and, and immigrants generally have a, an employment creation effect on the, on the economy. Just in a very specific way, Microsoft some years ago, and this was public information, Microsoft um, created a development center in Vancouver and they decided <clears throat> that it was so difficult bringing H-1Bs into the United States, they were going to bring them into Canada where the immigration laws were easier, bring them from India and other places, China, into Canada, and, uh, and uh, employ them in Canada, in Vancouver, just across the border from, from Seattle. Well, uh, it, a study was done, and it uh, concluded that for every H-1B job that Microsoft placed in Vancouver, three or four su support jobs were lost in uh, the state of uh, the state of Washington, and that's just you know something simple that math. simple math that companies deal with uh, every day. But you have at the moment crisis level shortages in these H-1B visas. It's a rec it's a serious recruitment issue. <clears throat> companies can't play in an international talent market if they're going to be saddled with uh, with H-1B uh, uh, restrictions like that. So if you have Today, if, if you are a business owner and you find this perfect person from abroad that's going to demonstrably increase your employment, increase your market share, uh, help the U.S. balance of payments, uh, create exports, you've got an 18-month window where you, you, from basically April 2 or 3 after the quota has been exhausted until the next October, the next year, you cannot employ that person and it takes you 18 months to employ that person, whereas your German or Japanese competitor is going to be able to employ someone immediately. It's, so. it's a remarkable way to destroy a company economy. It's, re it's remarkable. When you think about the economic benefits that come from immigration, it's, it's all about where Congress wants to see the future from. The, the idea that there's only X number of jobs in the U.S. and they're going to be filled by Americans or foreigners is just not true. It's just not true. There's no study that ever says that was true. Uh, there are always economic winners and looters, losers in any type of situation. And expanding immigration, like we're talking about, and changing it under this bill creates $1.4 trillion in economic growth over the next decade, $140 billion a year of growth, increases GDP by 3% over the next 10 years. There are losers. There are some low-end wage earners that will earn less because of the temporary worker program, but very few. And I find it interesting that some of the anti-immigration forces are now sticking up for principally what are African-American labor when they've been invisible for the last 40 years trying to help the African-American community, and now all of a sudden they're here. Um, but overall, fixing the employment-based immigration provisions, not just H-1Bs, but the legal permanent work part of that to get them green cards in the United States, improves our economy so much that it's, it's a no-brainer, it seems like, economically. And yet you still can't get folks to do what's in their best economic interest in Congress. Stunning that you can't get them to do that. Yeah, it, it's a, there's a, a recruitment problem for U.S. companies and a retention problem. The recruitment <coughs> problem has its best expression in the H-1B mm -hmm. issue, and then as Chuck mentioned, getting people green cards and so on, there's a major retention issue. You can't keep people and you can't incentivize them unless you can get them and their families out of limbo, get them and their families a green card. And currently there's 140,000 visas available for green cards, but out of that 140,000, probably at least 70 and probably more than 70,000, probably closer to 60% of the 140 are spouses and family members that have to be included in the 140. And one thing that the Senate bill does that's important is it exempts the spouses and families. It says if you're coming here to work, you can come to work and your spouse and family doesn't get counted again under the quota. 
which is pretty important. And it also substantially increases the, uh, the per country limit from what it currently is. For example, if I'm, an, if I'm from India and I work for Microsoft and I have a bachelor's degree and they sponsor me today, they start today, estimated I should get a green card in 2035, 2040. That's how long that line is. Because in front of me are 240,000 other Indian nationals with bachelor's degrees, plus their wives and kids. And for me, under the current quota system, there's a pro in my category, there's approximately 1,500 green cards a year. So you just do the math, 15, you know, 240,000 to 1,500, it's going to take a long time. This bill fixes that to a, to a great extent. And that's vitally important. To show you how bad the H-1B problem is, you may have heard in the news in the last week that a, a large foreign company called Infosys just agreed to pay a $35 million fine for immigration violations. You guys heard of that the last couple of days? What was that about? And that's interesting. What was that really about? That was a company who needed H-1B workers but couldn't get them, so decided to bring those folks in on business visitor visas. And they got in trouble because as business visitor visas, you're not supposed to work in the United States. But because it was so hard to prove that they were coming in and breaking the law, they didn't, the, the U.S. attorney couldn't prosecute the company. So he got them to pay $35 million because they didn't do I-9s for their people. I mean, that, that is an example of how broken the system is that companies will go out of their way to jerry-rig folks into the U.S. and find out that it's cheaper to do that and pay a $35 million fine than anything else. Because I'm going to tell you, they made more than $35 million on that, I'm guessing, on those folks. That's how bad the system is. I think at this time, I want to make sure we have enough time for questions from the audience. So if anybody has a question, please feel free to ask either all of the panelists or a specific panelist. No, I think your point is really well taken, and an example is right here in Georgia. When, when Georgia passed uh, HB 87, which was the Georgia bill uh, going after undocumented immigrants here in Georgia, it was quite clear when they were passing it, I was one of the ones that testified, said, you're going to get sued because I'm going to sue you because you pass this. <laughs> it's unconstitutional. And, and the, the Supreme Court had already ruled at that point on the Whiting case. The Whiting case was the, the, the lawsuit brought by the Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO against Arizona, uh, where Arizona mandated E-Verify use for all their employers, all, all their employers in the state. That was completely constitutional, as was found by the Supreme Court, because when Congress passed IRCA, they said you could do that. It was okay. But the next step that Arizona did, and then Georgia took to the next level, which was basically uh, statizing or making state uh, crimes in federal immigration violations. That was an unconstitutional step over. So by bringing that litigation, ultimately it got to the Supreme Court in the Arizona case before it got in the Georgia case, uh, where the Supreme Court said, no, you, you can't do that. That's actually one of the motivating factors behind, I think, the election and the findings that we can't allow the states to enact state immigration laws and expect to move forward federally. So yeah, I think there is a place, for example, in this Another piece of litigation, I, and I love litigating. It's one of my favorite things in the world to do because there's nothing better than suing the government and winning, nothing, <laughs> because they pay your lawyer's fees, which is even cooler because most of your clients can't pay you, and so that's the it's problem in immigration. Suing the government twice and winning. Twice and winning is even better. Uh, right now we're suing the Board of Regents here in Georgia because they refuse to let kids who have DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivers, to pay in-state tuition 
or to go to any school in Georgia, even though these kids, as defined by the federal government, are lawfully present in the United States. So they're no longer, quote, illegal. Uh, and yet, you know, we'll see what happens in December when we have a, a hearing in front of the judge, but there is a place for litigation. Unfortunately, it's not as sexy as the civil rights movement stuff, which was so based in the Constitution, but even at, even at the court level, where litigation has been brought on the issue of forcing judges to call for appointed counsel for mentally incompetent people to determine competency. That's now a requirement when that happens. That wouldn't have happened absent litigation on an issue to the board. And, and I would just add to that, there's groups that do have a similar litigation strategy, for example, the ACLU mm -hmm. Immigrant Rights Project. And, and so there are specific goals that they are, in fact, working on to try to establish favorable precedent and so forth. But, uh, but it's a good model, certainly, for them to try to follow. There, there is all kinds of litigation on immigration issues. I mean, massive amounts of litigation. We just happen to live in the 11th Circuit. <laughs> Well, there, there are a couple of ways to approach that. Num number one, if you, if you look in the past at, um, you know, just in our practices among the practicing attorneys on this panel, usually if you want to get it, someone an H-1B visa, you're going to get it for them eventually. It's a question of timing. Um, that problem is getting worse, though, and as the economy improves, I think it's going to get a lot worse. But, but up to now, if you want to get someone an H-1B the number of people where you have to say, my God, we, can't, we literally can't get you one is relatively few. Um, I do want to mention when, when you talk about the future and the increase in the quota and so on, there, there are some very significant, we, we, uh, the, the Senate bill is 800 pages and Professor Price did a great summary of 800 pages, but it's impossible to include everything obviously. And there are some serious problems in the Senate bill that we hope to negotiate out if and when there's a conference between the House and the Senate. One of them is that H-1Bs and by attribution other, other workers would have to be paid uh, enhanced wages. And that is a serious problem, not because companies underpay. Most, most companies pay very competitive wages to foreigners and, and, and they have pay equity policies where they pay the same to their U.S. workers and their foreign workers. But if they are forced to pay more to their foreign workers than they do to their U.S. workers, they're not going to be able to employ foreigners. It's going to have a chilling effect on employing those foreigners or they're going to have to raise wages overall, which is going to be very which inflationary and problematic, which, in, which increases the wage you have to pay the next year. So it's an inflationary spiral. Okay. That's exactly right. And that's a very, very serious problem. Uh, and if, if I may, and I know you didn't ask this specifically, but just, just while we're talking about problems in connection with the Senate bill, the Senate bill uh, monkeys with the business model of companies. It says, you know, if you employ more than 15% H-1B workers, we're really going to hammer you. And it, it sort of visits all kinds of retribution on companies that are so-called H-1B dependent, um, and including not letting them place workers at work sites of other... So if they're a vendor and they install technology, and they've got, for example, an inventory control technology, and they're going to go and install it at a company. They wouldn't be able to do that if they employ more than 15% H, uh, H-1Bs. And that, it just so happens, most of the companies that have more than 15% H-1Bs are either from India or <coughs> Indian connected. So um, that is really a disproportionate slap at India and which fortunately just in recent weeks is being characterized as it should as a trade issue, not, not an immigration issue, it's a trade issue. And um, the Indian government is in discussions with the U.S. administration about it and there's some talking about fixing it in some way, but, but it's a problem. Yeah, almost as if it's a tariff. 
in right. some ways. Terrible. But the interesting point you bring up, where did the numbers come from anyway? For example, in 1990, Daryl, where did the 60,000, 65,000 H-1Bs come from? I'll tell from? you exactly. Warren, I know you know. That's why I want you to tell well, us about it. Well, <laughs> Warren Lydon, who, who uh, was the, uh, at the time the executive director of the association that uh, that uh, Chuck and I have been the president of American Immigration Lawyers Association. He and I were were talking to Bruce Morrison, and Bruce said we we're banning H-1B visas, and they had a proposal to ban it. And we said, my God, you can't do that. And we got the Chamber and NAM and and the American Electronics Association and and everybody involved in that. And we sat around the table, and he said, okay, well, I'll I'll, I'll give you forty thousand. And we said current usage is 50,000. Mm -hmm. You can't give us 40,000. He said, okay, 60. Well, it ended up being 65. That, that that's what it was. It, that's right? what it was. Yeah. A negotiation. Yeah. Yeah. No basis in reality no basis in or reality. demand or no. studies. No. Just made it up. That's right. Welcome to the world of immigration. Yeah. Yeah. In the back. Well, I think, you know, I don't think uh, I, I agree. I do agree. I don't think I disagree with the proposition that regulation should be carefully calibrated to the specific issue. So in connection with agricultural workers, there, there actually should be more regulation than there is with respect to certain white-collar workers, and particularly in areas where you know there's, there, there's a, a specified shortage. But there is a lot of regulation in the agricultural area, so I'm not sure about the experience. Don't you think, Chuck? Yes. I mean, yeah. In fact, there's there so much regulation that farmers won't use it. I mean, that's how much regulation it is. It's so expensive to comply with the H-2A regulations. That's why most, folk, most farmers will use undocumented labor. That and the fact that undocumented labor, in their opinion, tend to be better workers. Not because they can necessarily exploit them. There was, um, you all know what happened here in Georgia when HB 87 passed. Uh, it was it passed in uh, April at the end of the session. It so happens that harvest season for South Georgia started a week later, just out of, just out of a terrible coincidence. And what happened? The farm workers that are migrant that would typically go from Florida to Georgia to the Carolinas to Virginia to New York, New Jersey, and then come back down in the fall, skipped Georgia. Skipped Georgia. There was literally nobody to pick crops. And uh, a reporter from Channel 2 went down there to do a story. Hey, I want to be a farm worker. So he gets to the farmer, and it's a raspberry farm. And he goes out, and he gets assigned to work with one of the legal workers who happened to be there, Jose. So here's how you do it. Here's what you do. At the end of the day, he gets the report. It's still on their website. It's a terrific report. Uh, he had made, the reporter had made $8 because you get paid by piece, you know, what you, what's usable from the, the Jose had made $230 that day. Because I'll say, because this is not unskilled labor by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so the farmer in the story was, this is why I hire people that know how to do this work and not people that walk off the street. Of course, the governor's solution was to send prisoners. That didn't work out so well either. But uh, I've yeah. actually, I've actually, one of the things that's interesting about these, it, well, I've done H2Bs. I have a lot of clients that are farmers. Um, and it's prohibitive for the farms to actually go through the process uh, to become H-2B employers. It, uh, it, when HB 87 was passed, I had several farmers approach me and say, you know what, Amna, we want to do this the right way. Let, you know, we've used you for years. Help us get to the point where we can bring in these workers. 
the process of getting these farmers to the point where they could actually employ H2B workers was one of the biggest uh, nightmares that I'd gone through in my almost 14 years of practice. In addition to that, um, the, the, farm, the, the workers that actually come in, the, the farmers are actually, uh, you know, um, responsible for those workers that come in if they disappear. There's a high rate of abandonment in these types of visas. When you have a lower level of education, um, you're more likely to, to migrate according to, for example, um, the, the, uh, the different seasonal patterns for, for picking <laughs> whatever produce there is or whatever the case may be. Um, then, for example, if you're somebody who has a family and you're, you have a master's degree and you're coming here to try to get a green card with IBM, the likelihood of you abandoning your visa and just suddenly becoming this migratory worker, is, uh, it's a lot lower um, than, than if you are a migrant farm worker who came here. So what we found is uh, I put, you know, I, we, we did so much work um, for these farmers. We, we got them to the point where they could bring over 50 to 80 uh, workers to separate farms, and they lost more than half their workers because of HB 87 and, and what was going on here in Georgia uh, with respect to racial profiling and, and just the inhospitable conditions um, towards uh, Latinos in, in, in the state. So, you know, they as much effort as they put in, as, hard, as much money as they paid me, the state, uh, I mean, everything that they had to go through, they ended up still losing more than half their workforce. So, There's um, no easy solution to, the, to this program. Yeah. There's just no easy solution. As long as we remain a country dependent on foreign labor for certain types of work that we do, there's no easy solution. Right. Uh, none of us that have kids say to our kids, you know, Bobby, I need you to quit high school and go pluck some chickens up in Gainesville. We don't do that. We tell our kids, you got to go to college, you got to go to law school. We don't tell them to go to law school. Uh, <laughs> medical school. Medical school. Go to medical school. I'm going to be old one day, specialize in geriatrics. Um, because we don't want to do that work, yet we want to eat chicken that costs $8 a bucket. Well, $8 a bucket chicken doesn't happen because you're paying the chicken plucker $42 an hour. I mean, everything has a price. And that's the problem in the society we currently live in. Well, and another thing, though, that was interesting to go back to Chuck's point about um, the, the people who were making more money who were migrant workers, um, my, my, my farmers, they had to, as one of the conditions of becoming H2B employable uh, farms, they had to place ads with the Georgia Department of Labor. And um, they got maybe two or three applicants, and it turned out those applicants were only getting in touch with them so they could check off a box to continue to get uh, their unemployment checks. They never actually showed up to the interviews. So, and, and you know, just from talking to people, they, the migrant workers that do work for them ultimately do work harder. But what it ultimately it, it spoke to me and, and made me wonder, what was the incentive for these people to go through all this? As, as the attorney that handled these cases, I know I was frustrated at the end that I went through all this for them. And then at the end of the day, they were still understaffed. And it made me just so angry at, at our system and, and how it makes even people who are bringing in so much revenue for our state, unable to, to function, unable to do business. I know if the state took away my ability to do business, I would, I would be very angry. And that's ex essentially what we've created with our immigration system. By the way, Stephen Colbert did a really great episode on farm workers in New York, where he went out and he was a farm worker. If you haven't seen that, you should download it. It's really pretty good and very true. I think we'll take maybe one more question, and if our panelists could stick around, if people have last-minute questions in the back. Well, uh, others may know much more about this than, than I do, but it, it's just, I mean, it's essentially a, like a renter's deposit. You know, you, it, if you leave and leave everything in good order, then you can get your 
money back. So I guess it's just a way to try to prevent overstays because the United States doesn't have a good way of doing that right now. They don't, um, we don't have a developed exit system so that we know who has actually overstayed versus who has left. And so I think they're just, it's, um, you know, some members of Congress are just looking for other ways to try to provide incentives for persons to comply with the limits of a visa. The, the Senate bill and House bill does have an exit control system mandate in it, uh, but no funding for it. So anybody who's traveled to Europe, you've been to Europe and you go to the airport like in Amsterdam and, you, and you, when you go in, of course, you have your passport. But you remember, when you come out, you also go through passport control. That's why you're stealing those little glass rooms at the gate, so you can't leave because you've been through passport control. Do we have that in America? No. You just go to the international terminal, hop on a plane, and off you go. That's why we don't know who stays. So part of this bill is, is not only holding their money so we know they go, but also developing an exit control system from the United States. Now, my had a better suggestion, I think it will work just fine, if we just implant an RFID chip and everybody that comes to America, we can track them wherever they go and make sure they leave, but there's some civil libertarians that have a little problem with that, unfortunately. But I did invest in an RFID chip company just in case. <laughs> just in case. Okay, well, thank you all so much for being here, and please join me in thanking our panelists.